Lissa Productions. Welcome to Electronics Lab. Today we're going to be talking about how to keep a lab notebook, the book that we basically put our notes in, take our measurements in, and then do our analysis in, and ultimately would let us write a more sophisticated report if we're going to do that. There's a sample in the back of our lab manual. So if you open your lab manual to Appendix E, there's the sample lab report. And a couple things if you want to look through this, and you really should look through this, is that the, you can read this and you can reproduce the lab by what is written in here. There's sufficient information written in here without reproducing the whole lab description that you should be able to retake the measurements and verify them. This is a critical part of a lab book. What we're going to do now is we're going to walk through the various steps in here and look at various parts of this. So we start, we look, the, all the labs start with a purpose, which basically describes what are the goals of this lab, what are we trying to learn. And this might be something that you would write down about this sample lab if you read through it, which is learn how to measure input and output resistances. Now if we look at that, that doesn't tell us an awful lot. It's pretty vague, input and output resistances of what, what is the purpose of that, what are we going to do with that. Actually, we should probably add a little bit more information than what we've got there. So what I have here is a better purpose. It's not exactly the same one that's in the lab book, but it pretty much says the same thing. It says we're going to measure the input and output resistance of the circuit shown. So we've drawn the circuit over here. It's got an input and an output, and there's some resistors, and there's some component X in there. And we will use a DC power supply to vary the input voltage. So we're going to hook some DC supply here, vary input voltage, and hence we're going to vary the current. And then we're going to make IV curves to determine R in and R out. And we're going to do this with two different things for X, a resistor and an LED. So all of that is laid out here. So now you have a, a pretty good idea of what's going to happen in the lab. It doesn't give us the details of what we're going to do, but it's sort of the big picture. And because this circuit is complicated enough and it's common to this whole lab, we list it there as well. The one that's written in Appendix E is also quite good. It's slightly different from this. So let's move on to the procedure section of the lab. So in this part, we're measuring the input resistance for the circuit if we replace this component X with a 1 kilo ohm resistor. So we wrote a procedure, X equals R5 is 1 kilo ohm, vary the input voltage of a variable DC voltage from 0 to 12 volts, and measure VN and IN to get RN. And so that's a plausible procedure that you might have written down in your lab book. But there's a lot of things that just are incomplete in this. So why don't you pause the video for a second and think about what might be incomplete in this. And then we'll come back in a second and talk about what those things are. OK, so we've looked at this. So probably we should say what we're going to do. So we're going to measure Rn for x resistor. So we're going to measure Rn for x being a resistor. So that's sort of the title of this. Something else that's missing is we should be better to say what these components are. So this is, they're all, turns out they're all supposed to be one kilo ohm resistor. So it'd be useful to have those on there. And something else that is very important is we just, we don't take the values for granted but we measure them. So we would go in with our DVM, or our ohm meter, and we'd measure those resistances. So we should actually measure all six of these resistors and record those values. So let's go ahead and do that. OK, so we went in, we measured them, and so we had expected one kilo ohm, and we measured these values here. We write those in the lab book in case we need them. In this particular lab, we're going to keep using the same resistors throughout the lab. So it's only really necessary to record the measured values once. And that's what's done in that sample lab. The next thing here, if we look at this procedure itself, it says we're supposed to measure V in and I in to get R in. Well, how are we going to measure those? We need to put a voltmeter and an ammeter in the circuit somewhere to be able to do that. So we know V in is the voltage here. So somehow we need to put a a voltmeter in the circuit so we can actually measure the voltage there. And we also need to put a current meter 
in the circuit so we can measure the current going into the circuit. So now we can measure the voltage, input voltage with this voltmeter and the input current with that ammeter and we can do our measurements. So we should now probably detail a little bit more in this procedure to take advantage of this information that we've added to the circuit which is actually critical in making this measurement. So let's go ahead and do that. So here we've got a much better procedure here. We, uh, measuring Rn for the component X being resistor. So the first thing, we're going to build the circuit shown with X equal to 1 kilo ohm resistor. So R5 is this 997 ohm resistor. We have the meter shown. Now we're going to vary Vn from 0 to 12 volts and measure Vn and In on those meters. And we'll use roughly 2 volt steps in Vn unless something unusual happens. So that's our nominal value. And then we're going to use the data to make an In Vn curve. So we're going to plot IN versus VN to make an IV curve, and we're going to use that to produce, to measure the input resistance of this circuit. So there's a much better procedure there. It describes what we're going to do. The circuit diagram is correct, measured components, and a section title that lets us know what we're doing in this particular section. All very important. So if you look at the one in the sample, you'll see all of these components there. Let's now look at what happens as we start collecting data. Okay, so here maybe is the data that we collected from our measurements here. And I've left a few out. I didn't feel like writing them on the board, but you can see roughly the two volt steps in voltage, measured current, calculated resistance. And then something else that's very useful to do is to make a sketch of current versus voltage as I'm going along. So I've done that here. So every time I make a point, measure a point, I plot it on here. And what you see here, that looks like a pretty smooth line there. So that gives me encouragement to believe that I haven't made a mistake anywhere. If I were to make a measurement and find one of these points were way off the curve, say down here or something, I would probably want to go back and remeasure that point to make sure I understood what was going on. And if I saw something where suddenly things started to change, so if it started doing this on me, then I may want to go and get more points in that particular region there to make sure that I've mapped things out correctly. However, in this lab, none of those funny things happened. It all looks relatively smooth. So I've got the data here. It all looks reasonable. But let's look at this, this for a second. There are some issues here. There's some things that we did not record properly that are going to make it almost impossible for someone to re accurately reproduce our data. So let's stop the video for a second. You look at this and see if you can identify some of the things that are wrong. Okay, so we start with this. The first and probably the most important thing, what are the units that we measured things in? Turns out that this is in volts, this is in milliamps, and then this is in kilo-ohms. So we need to have those units there. We can just write them at the top of the column or we can write them on each number, it doesn't matter. But those units need to be there because they're very important. They tell us what the number is that we measured. Is it volts, millivolts, amps, milliamps? What is it? And those also need to go here. So we have milliamps and volts on the same scale there. Something else that's important is we don't actually measure R. This is a calculated quantity. It's not something that we've directly measured. We've computed it from these. So somewhere in here, we have to have R equals V over I. We can write it in this column. We can write it in the collected data. We can write it in our procedure. But somewhere, we need to point out the fact that this is a computed quantity. It's not something we measured. And you may want, if you're doing it in your lab book, put a dashed line to show it's computed. In Excel, you're just going to have a column that computes this, but we need to show that somewhere. So now we've got the information we need. We've got the units, computed quantity. We've got the data. It all looks consistent. So let's move on and look at what happens when we do a data analysis of this. So doing the data analysis, we've presumably put this data that we've measured, the VNI, into Excel. I didn't do it here. I just left it on the board. But I, I'm going to assume you're going to be able to put it into Excel as two columns. The columns will be labeled with the units, so you have that. And then we're going to tell Excel to plot that. We're going to tell it to plot I versus V. And let's just assume that this is the plot that Excel made here. 
So it did this plot, it plotted the points, nice curve, and then you tell Excel to fit the data you have with a linear function. And when you tell it to fit that, you can also have it plot the resulting equation that it gets for that fit on the board there. So this is y equals about 2x plus about nothing. So that's the fit there. So that's what you'd get the very basic data analysis. In order to get this complete though, we need to now interpret what this equation is saying here. The y is the current and the x is the voltage and this slope is 1 over the input resistance. So what this equation really says is that the current is 1 over Rn times the voltage. And if there was some offset constant, we're expecting this actually to be 0, there'd be some nominal current that had nothing to do with this resistive part here. That's effectively 0. Let's just, so what we've got out of this, if we assume that that is 0 from this equation, we can really write that voltage is Rn times I, and Rn is 1 over this 2, so we need to, Rn is 1 over 2.001, and that's going to be in units of kilo ohm. So we get about half a kilo ohm from that. But we need to actually take these things and put them into a formula here and carry that through. So if you look in the example in your lab book, you can see got the simple fit. Now we need to interpret it and then come out and come up with a value for the input resistance, 0.5 kilo ohms here. And that's pretty much consistent with what we saw point by point, but this is a global fit. So we've now measured the input resistance of this circuit to be about half a kilo ohm, 500 ohms. So that's the data analysis part here. Look through the data analysis parts in all sections of that lab just to see what's done. If we were measuring the output resistance, that curve that we've got here doesn't look like this. It actually looks like this. And the slope, negative 1 over the slope is the output, output resistance. Same sort of thing. We're going to fit a slope. But now we're going to get a fit here and have to fit it to some formula that we expect for output resistance as a function of output voltage and output current to come up with that. And it's very important that we don't just leave this lying here alone uninterpreted, but we go, we put it in the formula that we expect, and we pull out the relevant meaning of those numbers because that's really what our measurement is in here. We need to be able to extract them and show where that extraction comes from. Okay, let's go ahead and summarize this lab then. Okay, so I've just written a summary for the part that we did with the resistor being the component X. And I've assumed we've done both the input which, impedance, which we talked about, and the output resistance, which we didn't, but is in the sample lab. So the summary is we measured R in and R out for the circuit with that one kilo ohm resistor. And we found a very linear relationship in those. So if you look at the data in the lab book and the one we looked at, very, very linear for both the IV curves for input and output. And from that, we extracted the input resistance of 500 ohms and the output resistance of 385 ohms. This is a comment we added that, as expected, R in does not equal R out. That's something we should expect from circuits. It's very rare that the input and the output resistances are the same. They're usually completely different. And that's actually an ad advantage. Sometimes that's a very desirable feature. So it would be very surprising if they were the same. And we can't simply write R out equals R in. That's not true. This was a very straightforward lab. Everything was linear. Read through the lab sample, because there's a second part where the component is an LED. And that LED has an exponential IV curve, which introduces some interesting and odd behavior in here. And in that case, we don't find exactly linear relationships. We find that we can get a pretty good input and output resistance, but there's a suggestion that we may not have gone to low enough voltage on the input of the circuit, Vn, so that the LED turns off to see if something interesting changes in the circuit. So it's a suggestion there at the end that maybe we should have actually done some additional measurements that weren't asked for, as in the summary, that when we were done.
If you find that, you can write that in your summary. You may also want to actually, if you find that you've done something funny and you think, oh, that looks a little suspicious, just go back and measure a few more points and see if it verifies what you're thinking is, is funny about the lab. You can add that into the summary, put it in the lab, additional information. But that's what we do when we're doing research, is if we discover something that looks odd or something out of place, we may go back and measure it. This part, everything looked perfectly normal. The other part of the lab, which you should look through because there's some interesting notes there, look through that lab write-up before you turn in your first one to make sure that you get all the parts. But we sort of talked about the typical mistakes you might make in writing your lab book. So, so in the end, when you turn in your blue lab book and you get it back, you aren't surprised with a 50, but you're very pleased with a 90% on this. Just follow the steps, make sure you do all the things, and everything should be fairly straightforward here.